everyone, welcome to another episode of Tea Time Talks. As you can see, I rounded up two of your favorite people as well as two of my favorite people, some of whom <laughs> you are calling the Friday Night Dream Team, otherwise known as <laughs> Terry Gibson and Tony Padilla, or who I like to call, quite frankly, TNT. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Tony play <laughs> eardrums to this. <laughs> Obviously. And then guitar, whatever you need to follow the rhythm. How are you? <laughs> So how are you guys? Terry obviously not obeying the rules, not practicing yeah. social distancing. He's in our studio. Yeah, I thought I'd go with some creative uh, artwork for the background. Um, I must stress, I'm not in Barcelona. This is a photo. And I didn't have um, an impressive bookcase, a map of the world. Um, I'm trying to think what other people, the creativity that they've come up with that I just couldn't compete with. So I thought... I'll go with the La Liga TV studios and Vicente Ibora on my shoulder. So you, you better explain that, otherwise I can imagine a, a policeman going to the studio <laughs> in Barcelona. So someone told me that it's somewhere inside, so please go out. <laughs> oh man, that would, have been, that would be quite a sight to see. <laughs> Terry virtually in our studios, Tony in the comfort of his home as well. <laughs> Tony, how are you? It's been, what, like eight, nine weeks since I've seen you as well. How are you doing? Yeah. Working, um, so everything is fine. Uh, the end, uh, thanks to God, everyone in my family is safe and we still have jobs, but obviously a little bit worried about all, all that's going on in, in Spain. As, 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 uh, I'm sure that the most part of the people know it's a new system to fight against the, the COVID-19. Uh, yeah. That it's, It depends in which city, in which place you're living, you're in a different phase. I'm living in Barcelona city, and it seems that in Barcelona it will be like the last city where we will have more options to go out on the street but if it's the, the best thing to fight against the the covid i think that it's the right choice so it's uh, almost two months close at home and just sometimes for example today at eight o'clock maybe it will be a time to go out and walk a little bit but just a little <laughs> so uh you're not going to be waking up at 7 a.m every day to go out for a run then we're not going to find you in the streets of no uh, <laughs> no I re Tony, I re come on <laughs> no, 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 no. I respect a lot the people that uh, used to do a sport, but I'm not this kind of uh, person. I prefer to walk. <laughs> Fair enough. So the reason I brought the two of you together today, because I thought it would be really interesting with everything that's happening in, in, in Europe right now, in the world in general, but specifically focusing on Europe because that's where we are. And football, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the five big leagues because every single country, every league has made different decisions um, and each one is worth, uh, is worthy of their own sort of individual case study, if you like. So we can kind of catch up on what's going on, try to break things down and give our opinions as to what we think have been some of the right decisions or some of the right calls or maybe what we can expect to happen in the future as well. So why don't we start off with France since they were the first country to make a decision as to what they wanted to do uh, in terms of sport overall, really, because it, it was out of the French League's hands to ultimately make a decision because it was the French president who said, you know what, there's no sport whatsoever until September. So that means that the league is done. Obviously, there were a lot of teams that were not happy about this, PSG being one of them. They've said that they're going to go ahead and push for playing in the Champions League anyway if they can. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. But then there's plenty of other teams that were fighting relegation that potentially could be looking into creating some legal battles over the summer. But do you think that with the situation, with the coronavirus, that this was, in fact, the smartest decision that's been made so far? It's hard to say. It's hard to say because I think each uh, country has a different reality. And we had to understand also that uh, behind the decisions that took by the authorities that run football, we had different realities. And we had to try to explain that before. The main reason when we talk about why we, come, we want football to come back, it's economical reasons. Right. And here in Spain, everyone is talking about that. The most part of the clubs needs the money of the TV rights. So that's where need, they need to play. And in the case of France, that was also quite important. Um, well, I think if there's France, one thing that all five countries have in common, it's the money, isn't it? Yeah. And in, and in that case, 
uh, in France, a lot of cl- uh, a lot of clubs were interested in end this season and start a new one because the next season is start a new deal of TV rights that will pay more money. So also some clubs say, okay, we will lose some money if we end the league here, but if we start the next league uh, next summer in September, for example, it's more money for us. So also the money it has been important in order to understand why the most part of the clubs understood that that was a good decision and they agree with that with the exception obviously that the two teams that are getting relegated that maybe will uh, go to the justice and try to fight for its place hmm. yeah I, I my my opinion of, of, with all the leagues so far has been they have to be finished now there's no I, I don't think there's any rush why why do you throw away a, a season that's three quarters of the way through hmm. to start to, to start a new season? And I've never been in a rush for stuff to, to, to resume. So I just feel that, it, especially with the European Championships being cancelled, so that gives everybody a, a, a bit of breathing space. Mm-hmm. Um, with France, you've got to remember that, that PSG is still in the, the Champions League as well. So there is talk that they're going to have to play their home leg in that game outside of France. Right. So it's it's I think it was too hasty. Um and if it takes till we don't start next season until November, then that you know we're in surreal circumstances here. No one's ever had any situation like this. I understand there are going to be issues logistically with players' contracts and, and stuff like that. I get that, but it's it's going to be the same for everybody. It's not as if you know certain teams are protected. From that, everybody's going to have the same situation, and and I, I was just right from the very beginning. Just my idea, my my thoughts were just everybody be patient. Hmm. Um, in an ideal world, we would have supporters back in the stadium, but that's not going to happen for this the remainder of any of the seasons in, that we find ourselves in. So, play games behind closed doors in the right circumstances at the right time um, with the right safety measures. That would be a boost for everybody because you know we're all, we're all searching around for stuff to watch. If we can watch live football, it may not be in the the manner that we're used to watching. I've seen talk of television companies suggesting that they can put on CGI the crowd and and generate crowd noise. Today there's a report in the English press about they're worried about the industrial language of players in stadiums where there's no one going to be. But <laughs> and so we're going to have to a warn him before because I tell you, there, there will be some industrial language. Um, so it's, it's really trying circumstances, but I, for one was hoping obviously Holland closed their, down, their mm-hmm. season down and France have closed theirs down as well. But I just want patience and I want to see, this season finished at some stage. I want to see the right teams that win the league titles. I want to see the right teams in the Champions League for the next competition, and the, the, you know the, the correct teams get relegated. So I, I never really got the idea of why we're throwing away all this. Just get ready to start again in September, uh, August, September, which we normally do. Um, we can finish this season off then. I actually think you bring up a really, really good point because. Keeping in mind that two years from now, the World Cup in Qatar is going to be in November, December anyway, this actually could be a really good opportunity for world football even to kind of have another look at changing the calendar, at least for the next few years, and maybe finishing out this season as long as it takes, as you said, maybe all the way through November to December, then maybe in January or maybe March, something like that, you start the next season, you go from March to to November, let's say. You do that for 2021, and then you do the same for 2022, and then since we have to take a break anyway to go to the World Cup in, in 2022, maybe... It's, an, it's actually a perfect opportunity to kind of shift things a little bit, at least for the next three, four years. And that way, as you say, every league gets their champion, every league gets their, their teams that they're going to have in, in European competition. Every league has those that are going to be uh, relegated or those that are going to be promoted from the second division. And everybody's happy at the end of the day. And, and players don't necessarily have to risk getting injured because that's a whole other story that we'll get to but they can take their time easing back into the game rather than trying to rush and compress everything to get everything done and risking injuries, which is something I think apart from players being worried about getting the virus, they're obviously very worried as well about picking up muscular injuries. 
Yeah, and I think there's the, the other compromise that will have to be made is, is that um, the transfer windows have to change. Oh. You know, they have to... It, when I played, they, there was no transfer window. The transfer market closed about uh, towards the end of March. So no one could buy their way out of relegation or buy the title in the last six to eight weeks of the season. And uh, do you know what? That, that kind of worked because... When I look back now, the teams have different circumstances, cash flow problems of certain clubs where they, they're only allowed to sell a player in the summer or in that January transfer window. And I kind of felt that's always been a grey area where there could be room for change. You know, so I, I you know, I've got transferred during the season. Players got transferred during the season. And, and, and it, it wasn't uncomfortable for everybody it wasn't the ideal time it was but it was something that we got used to but now we see these situations where there's so much pressure on a transfer window clubs you know overspend players run out of that you know that transfer deadline day where we run out of time and a a player is unsettled and you know I just think there is a possibility we could go back to that if the seasons are you know in the wrong months, as we would call them traditional football seasons. But so there's a lot of compromises to be made. But I think I would just urge patience, safety, and finish off this season whenever that is. International football has suffered and will have to suffer. I think next season, whenever that is, of course, mm-hmm. we don't need these two week international breaks. You could just have what we used to have again the players meeting up after the weekend's games, planning international on a Wednesday night going back to their clubs and doing that more often as opposed to taking two-week chunks out of the season. Right. How long a break do the players need between one season ending and the new season starting? I would and say they also need a pre-season too, don't they? They do now, but if they were to only have a short break between the seasons hmm. and everybody's going to have to make compromises, then I, I don't see that being a problem. Yes, the international tournaments, pre-season competitions will suffer because... And clubs will suffer a loss of revenue in terms of going off to the US and Australia and China and playing prestigious pre-season friendlies. But we could end this season in September, October. I don't think that will happen. And you could start a new season two weeks later. I know there'll be issues about transfers and new squads and, and stuff like that. But we've all got to make change to deal with this current situation. Now we have a big problem, and is that, for example, if we talk about what is going on in France, we have to remember, as Sandra point, that it's also a political decision. It's a, it's the government of France that uh, didn't allow any sporting event to take place in France for the next month. So obviously, uh, in France, it was two main facts. One is that the most part of the clubs had the desire to end the season, to start a new one because it's more money in the next season, as we said, because we're talking about the, the TV rights. And then is the, 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 that political fact. So if in France, that it's a country with so much tradition in other sports, they decide that this season it's not Roland Garros tournament of tennis, but it's in a sport without contact. Hmm. Then you cannot run have a football game because it will be obviously uh, an, a strange decision to have a football game going on when a tennis game it's not allowed when in tennis it's not contact and in football we have and also it's even they force it to change the dates of Tour de France of, of cycling that is the, one of the maybe the main sporting event in the whole year in France even more s- stronger than the football league right. so we have to, this, these two ideas the political fact. And the fact that the, the most part of the big clubs said, okay, it's, it's fair enough for us. We close the season, we start a new one, and we have more money there. But now imagine the situation for the UEFA, for the UEFA because that is now it's really complicated. Because we have right now, and we'll talk about these leagues right now, uh, Spain, for example, with the goal to end the season on July and then play the last games of the Champions League on August. That it means that the players will rest in September and October, maybe. So maybe we have the French League coming back with the new, the new season on, on September, and in the same month, uh, the other big club, uh, big leagues with the players on holidays. Yeah. So the next calendar, it will be quite crazy. And it's really interesting to hear the point of view of Terry, because Terry talks as someone that loves the game and has been involved in the game. But I'm afraid that, that some people that take the decision, it's people that didn't play the game, and, don't, and his priority is not the game. It's just the money. Because when we talk, you talk with the people that are taking the decisions, they say that we need to save the most part of the money right now. Right. 
it's a business decision more than anything else. No, that's, that's an, perfectly it's a, understandable. It's an in industry decision because, you know, the, the, the governments make so much money from tax as well, from mm. football clubs, from the players. And that's been an issue in, in the Premier League. You know, the, the government want to help because, you know, the players pay get so much money, um, the managers, everybody involved. So many people work at football clubs. So many people pay taxes to the, the, the government that comes from football. So there, there's that element of it as well that, you know, if, if football clubs do suffer in the future financially, then, you know, it's going to, the, the government are going to take a hit. And we, we forget what a big industry it is in, in these five leagues we're, we're talking about. Um, how many people work at each of those football clubs? You know, how many people pay those taxes? How much money the governments make from revenue from the football industry? Um, and, and it's so such a wide, we're in the, the industry. You know, yeah. we, we don't pay the taxes that the you know, Messi pays and people like that. But <laughs> everything is, there's so many, it's such a big industry. Um, that I think it's the biggest sport in the industry in the world. Oh, no doubt. So I can see why you know people do want to to make sure that everyone survives because there's there's I mean it survives in terms of you know financially that the clubs and leagues survive because it's it's hugely important. Well, that takes us over to to Germany because um, as we already know, they're set to to come back. To, to action May 16th, I think it is. So next week in about seven days' time, more or less. And that was a decision, obviously, a financial decision had something to do with it. There was talks that I think it was half of the 36 teams over the two divisions, 18 of the 36 teams were very much in very deep trouble financially if, in fact, the season wasn't going to be finished. So that was certainly a contributing factor for the eventual decision to continue to play on. Um, but the other obviously glaring fact is the fact that Angela Merkel, the government, they have deemed the situation to be safe enough for players to go back to the pitch. And it's interesting because they've obviously, as a country, they've handled this situation much better than, you know, Spain or France or Italy or the UK, even out of the five, they've handled it the best. Um, and they seem to be in a much better position in order to go back uh, to finishing off the season. They certainly have a lot of... Uh, rules in place a lot of very detailed <laughs> rules as well which is important it needs to be there but the thing i find the most curious i guess all of it because they have everything so much in place to keep social distance to keep those six meters between players or to between people to make sure that there is no contact that no one is touching each other there's no handshakes before the games there's no photos before the games but at the end of the day football is a contact sport so I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of football we're actually going to get when they actually go back out onto the pitch. Because are they going to try and avoid, you know, tackling one another or pushing one another? Because they're not allowed to celebrate scoring goals either. You know, they're not allowed to... Uh, there's so many rules now put in place within the game itself that it'll be really interesting just to see how the players react and adapt to it, quite honestly. I don't understand why you cannot celebrate the goal with your teammates because uh, when you play the game, it's, it's supposed that you have been training with them, so right. living with them, and you have been playing with them. So uh, I think maybe the idea to don't celebrate the the goals together, as we really saw in in South Korea, the the, the game, yeah. the football league from South Korea came back uh, this uh, weekend also, and we saw them playing as always with the same energy. But then celebrate the goal alone. Maybe it's like to send a message to the people, to send a message to the people that is watching from home and saying, this is still no over, so please, re you have to remember that we ha still have to defeat the COVID-19. But if someone can do that in Europe, are the Germans. Obviously, they are in the best yeah. in the best situation because they deal with the COVID-19 in the best way. They happen in, in an amazing uh, chemical industry. They invest a lot of money in investigation. That's why they have a lot of tests to be done on the, po on, on the population, exactly. uh, something that didn't happen, for example, here. So they have been, uh, they allowed uh, individual training seasons for some weeks ago. Now this week, they are already training more or less uh, in something that it's quite similar than the old training, <laughs> but with, and let's see well, what, they're, what they're is- basically in quarantine for, for this week, right? They're kind of in these isolated yeah. camps where they're all supposed to be not interacting with the public or families or anything like that. 
Yeah, that, that's the idea. The idea is if someone obviously is positive, it's, it's in quarantine, and then they ask for the players to have a big responsibility because if the players doesn't want to be close in an hotel or in a sporting complex for weeks, it's like, okay, you can come back home, but then please don't uh, organize a party with your friends there. <laughs> so just your family and ask also your family to, to use the head because it's a lot of money to uh, hear that we were, we're fighting for. But right. generally, in, in, some, in some sense, they, they are different than the others. As you, you point, Sam, a lot of clubs need the money of, of the TV rights. But even in that situation, the fourth richest clubs, that I think it's Bayern, Borussia Dortmund, uh, Rassemble Sport, uh, RB Leib, uh, Leipzig, and the fourth one, I think it's Schalke, decided that in case if the league is not over and uh, the other clubs lose a lot of money, they will take the money of his own pockets and give it to the little teams yeah. in order to allow the league to end in a, in a proper way. That's why they are different. I think in Germany, we have to learn a lot of things about uh, football in Germany. And if they find a way to play next week, it will be a good message. But don't forget that the reality in Germany is different than the reality in Italy, in the United Kingdom, and especially in Spain. Yeah, but even still, they very much want to be the example to be followed in all of the leagues that are still trying, you know, they're on the fence about what they should do, whether they should continue or not. All eyes are going to be looking at the Bundesliga to see what happens, to see if, it, if they can pull it off and to see if it doesn't work. But you're right. I think there is a very interesting social aspect uh, to Germany in, in a good way, in a positive way, that I think it could actually be very successful for them. Other leagues, other countries, I'm not so sure, to be quite honest with you. I mean, sorry, the, the, the situation with the Premier League is probably the most shocking to use, I don't know, for lack of a better word, of, of all of them. It seems to be the most confusing, the most troubling, the most, uh, there's a lot of infighting between all of the clubs as well. It, it's really interesting what's happening over there. I mean, from your perspective, where do you think we're at and what do you think will ultimately be decided? Well, first of all, we have to, the, the efficient Germans, eh? that's a surprise, <laughs> on every aspect. Um, and, and I think there are, uh, the, the big leagues will be grateful that it's Germany that's starting first because we can learn lessons from what they're doing. We can copy Germany if it does work. And I, I'm pretty sure it will work. Yeah, I think um, so too. And, but I like the point that Tony made about them helping each other, the clubs helping out, making sure that the, the league is going to be completed. In England, in the solidarity, the that doesn't seem to yeah. be the case in England. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and I think we have to be careful because a lot is speculation. You know, it's a, it's a great time in the media for speculation, hmm. and, and and we do hear stories in particular about the six teams that yeah. are threatened with relegation. Um, in in the Premier League, they're talking about using neutral stadiums. Right. Whereas in Germany they're not. They're going to continue playing in the, you know, the the the, the proper ve the right venues. In in the Premier League they're talking about neutral stadiums. That is purposely done because of, they're worried about. Let's be honest, Liverpool. If Liverpool win the not if when Liverpool win the league, they're worried that a hundred thousand Liverpool supporters are going to be around the outside of Anfield yeah. to celebrate, and they're going to be worried that we saw it with PSG's. Champions League match against Dortmund, where it was just the beginning of the lockdown. It was games behind that was played behind closed doors, and there was thousands of PSG supporters outside the stadiums, outside the stadium cheering their team and cheering the goals. And then, foolishly, at the time, the players underestimated the importance. They came out and celebrated at the back of the stadium, up high. I see Di Maria with his shirt off, and and encouraging people. <laughs> to be outside in big numbers. So I think that's the reason. that It's not purely Liverpool, of course, but there is going to be a mass, you know, a, a, there would be, no, in normal circumstances, a massive celebration of Liverpool fans for winning the Premier League. Right. So I think they're worried that, in general, it could be any club, that there would be 5,000 supporters outside trying to make a noise, um, trying to generate an atmosphere that sounds relatively like a normal game of football. Um, the Bundesliga so has actually done something really interesting and they've decided, going back to the whole neutral thing, uh, neutral venue, why they've decided not to do it. They've just basically said if any fans, any home fans turn up and, and linger or celebrate or gather outside of the stadium, the home team automatically is going to lose the game. 
Perfect. So the away side is going to walk away with a victory, no matter what, those three points. So it's encouraging fans to stay away and to stay home, because if they do go and gather around the stadiums, they're actually going to punish their own team, and it's going to have the opposite effect. And I think but then you might have really away supporters. <laughs> you they might have away supporters dressing up as home supporters, <laughs> congregating <laughs> around the ground and getting the, getting the points. No, I it, it, it is, in a Spain, someone will, will have the, that idea in mind for sure. That will be really Spanish to, to, exactly, to do. Exactly, that would be such a Spanish thing to do. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> But I think what they're trying to do in the Premier League is that the, they use the grounds where they're not surrounded by houses. Right, OK. So, for instance, Manchester City's ground has been mentioned. West Ham United's ground. There's some other grounds where you, you they're not. I mean, Anfield is right in the middle of houses. Everton, Manchester United could be used. Um, White Hart Lane is on a high street, surrounded by houses. So I think they're trying to look at ways of how they can play them in venues where they they could probably police them. I mean, you can't stop people going to that coming out of their houses because Tottenham are playing. 200 yards down the road. Yeah. So I think they're trying to look at that type of it. And the, the teams at the bottom are looking at a loophole because, you know, they're threatened with relegation. They don't want to lose the £100 million pounds that come with being, just being in the Premier League. Right. And But it, that, that's wrong. We, we need solidarity. We need sportsmanship. We need everybody to pull together. And, and hopefully that the, the Premier League... I'm pretty sure that situation will be resolved. Why not just, if they all, they have to vote, if those six vote for that, relegate the six of them, if that's how, how they feel. Because they're only protecting their self, they're only sure. looking after their self-interest, and we don't need people like that in, involved at the moment. But then you could argue the six, the, sort of the big six clubs are kind of doing the same as well. They're not exactly showing all of their cards, they're kind of keeping them to their chest. And there's even sort of, talk that this could be the perfect setup for them breaking away to form a Super League because they aren't exactly acting necessarily in solidarity either with the rest of the teams in the top flight. I don't know if you get that that feeling as well or or if that's just something as well trying to kind of create and stir up a little bit of more... It in my case, when I when I talk with with the Spanish clubs, obviously, but also I, I have some some friends working in some some teams in our in other leagues, like in Italy or, or England. I think that um, it's true that some big clubs have that idea in mind to have a, that Super League, but it's not the time. Yeah. The problem is that the, the COVID, that no one expected COVID nineteen. So uh, right now, it's true that they are thinking about the future and how can be football for the next seasons. But the main goal of the most part of the clay of the clubs is to save this season because they have been working with the idea that we will have a lot of money in our pockets and suddenly this money disappears because it's not public understands and you're not selling the official merchandise and you don't have maybe money from the TVs. So they are more focused in trying to end this season. Even the clubs that maybe in two in two years want to destroy his local league to create a super league now wants to save this season, as happens uh, like for example like Juventus in Italy, because they expected some money, and this, if you cannot end the season, this money disappear, and then, then you will have problems. So and think that right now the situation is just a little bit different. It's more about save the economy and not still the moment to decide how it can be the football. Post the World Cup of Qatar, obviously, it will be a turning point. Hmm. So in, in the case of the Premier League, what do both of you think is ultimately going to happen? Do you think that they'll actually see it through? Or do you think that there is a real threat of them not being able to come together to reach an agreement and them just deciding to, to cancel the season? <clears throat> I think they, they'll try. My, my fear is that we might try too early. And, and we still have a massive issue in the UK with... COVID-19. Right. Well, it's, and, the second, and, it's the second most affected country in the world right now, isn't it, in terms of numbers of cases, maybe not numbers of cases, but no, numbers of deaths at the very least. Yeah, and the but, lockdown in restrictions are going to be lifted too, right? Well, we, that again, speculation. I think that comes on Sunday evening is going to be the next message from the Prime Minister. Mm. Um, there's lots of speculation, but the numbers are coming down in terms of people being infected and, and, and the, the the, the total of people that are losing their lives. So okay. it's we're going in the right direction. Um, but it, it, I'm, my worry is that in, in the UK, in the Premier League, we go too early. And, and you know, we, we, 
players will have the great. I've been to some of these training grounds. So I haven't been to too many in Spain, mm-hmm. um, but I've been to quite a lot of the training grounds in the Premier League, and they have medical departments that are like hospitals. You know, honestly, they they are incredible. They are. It, it's so far removed removed from when I was playing, where we we had one physio for the whole playing squad, first wow. team reserves, youth team. And at one club I played for, he was also the kit man. <laughs> and, and, and He's so, a very talented uh, Brazil. <laughs> he was just enthusiastic. And, and it, that was a, a team in, the, in the, the, the old first division, the equivalent of the Premier League. One physio and he was the kit man. And, and oh. there was a lady laund- doing the laundry. And, and every player, there was 30, 40 players from the first team, the reserves, the youth team players, all had to wait a turn if you had injuries. Um, to get treatment. Now you go there and there's like 12 hospital beds. There's uh, docs, full-time doctors. We had to go and queue up at the doctors to, to see a doctor. We only had a doctor on a match day and he was there to put stitches in people that cut their heads and stuff like that. And they they were normally drunk in the second half anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Every club I play for, yeah. They, they, Are they you were, guilty they... of that too, Terry? Did you ever go into the second half drunk? No, no. I mean, they, they, they were just great guys to be around the club. They loved the social. They came and had a meal, and then they, they enjoyed the afternoon. And if someone was unlucky enough to get a cut on the head, they were still capable of putting a couple of stitches in. Um, but so, but now there's full-time doctors at the clubs. There's it, it is incredible. So when you go to Europe, I was blown away. I went to Tottenham Hotspurs recently, and, and their training ground it is incredible. And they're going to have the, the, the best available. They've got all the resources. There's money is no object. The staff, the qualifications of the staff. So they're going to be looked after, but they can't. You can't stop someone, you know, catching this horrible virus um, that's debilitated the whole world. Just not just the world of sport. And my worry is in the Premier League is that if someone does pick up the virus, um, such as Mikel Arteta. That was a big warning sign. Everybody then started, you know, in the world of football, thought, oh, and it stopped. Everything stopped pretty much from that point on. If a player does test positive, um, then that might, you know, we might be, as we are in the UK in general, we just hope that we're doing the right thing at the right time. We're going in the right direction, but we we need to be patient still. So when looking at Italy and Spain, they seem to be the two countries that are kind of in the most similar situation, as in in Italy, all 20 teams voted to continue the season, although it seems yet to be confirmed as to how and when they will actually go back uh, to work. But in in Spain, they're definitely pushing very hard as well to resume the league. Um, There's talks that it could start as early as the 12th of June, finish maybe the 26th of July. So I think that's about a six week window uh, playing every three days or so on to get the season finished. Um, Obviously, it has been approved that players can go back to training. We've seen all of them getting tested over the last few days. Um, I think... Only one player so far was it Lodi from Atletico Madrid has actually no, it's positive? it's it's more. It's, more. It's, okay. It's it's a, a, a six or seven because really some some clubs are still they don't have the results. So okay. uh, so it's still not over. But between first and second division, I think it's right now seven eight cases. Okay. But uh, it's for example one at Atletico Madrid that we have the name. Also uh, Alex Ramiro, the goalkeeper of Real Sociedad, tested positive. But okay. it's on it's on the end of the process. So uh, also we have the name, and and we have, for example, teams uh, uh, have been talking with people of Girona in second division. That they told me that between the staff and the players, more than twenty persons tested that wow. they, they already passed COVID. So they have it and they defeat it. And the most right. part of these players um, didn't know that. It's like they were symptomatic. So you go, wow, I really passed the, the COVID nineteen. Yeah, you done it. Yeah. So. It's some positives, but it seems that it will be a lower number of positive cases than La Liga expected. La Liga have been talking about the expected more than 20 cases, yeah. and it will be maybe just 10. So that's good news. It means that the most part of the people um, has been close at home and uh, doing a good job. They, um, but, well, the problem is, as Terry said, what will, can happen if we have a positive case once the, the games are back? 
because right. now it's normal to not have a lot of positives because the most part of the people has been close at home. So it's, it, it is quite normal. But let's see what happened because the players ask to come back to training seasons just if they have uh, the word of the Spanish government. So they ask for the government to allow that. If the And now the government said that it's okay, that they should come back to his work as other people are doing. But it's, it's true that now we have two kind of problems. One is uh, uh, a logistic and a security problem. Mm -hmm. What can happen if we have positive cases in the next weeks? And the other one is from a moral issue. Is that some players understand that the most part, that, uh, that a lot of people in Spain, and they are right, understand that it's not ethic, it's not good to provide a lot of tests to football, player, football players when a lot of people that it's working in the hospitals didn't have that test. This right. is one of the problems. Uh, in Germany, all the people that works in an hospital pass the test. It's not the case in Spain. In Spain, we have people working in hospitals, police that is working on the streets, that they didn't pass the test and they asked for that. And now they had to see like uh, some young and say, and say uh, people like football players are passing a lot of tests. So from a moral point of view, it's that some football players, I remember Denis Suarez from Celta Vigo saying that, I'm not afraid to play it, I want to play it, but I don't feel great when I see people fighting against the COVID-19 in an hospital that they don't pass a test and I can pass a test. So I don't feel uh, in good as a person. Right. It's more a moral issue. Morally. They feel and, guilty uh, about it, they don't yeah, feel like they it's the right thing. And, it's, yeah. and I think it's, in, it's interesting because they, that showed that uh, football players also have uh, an... Um, public point of view and they understand the situation and they, they, know, they know that maybe it's not right that it's going on, but it's a lot of money and it's your job. You're trying to save your job. So it's not an easy situation for a football player. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Terry, if you were in the situation and you were still playing right now, what do you think that you would have liked to do? I think first and foremost, as a, a young person, which the majority of players are, um, Joaquin and Jorge Molina and one or two accepted, uh, of course. But no, you you're, you you are fearless and you do want to play. You, you then you would that's from, from a purely selfish point of view. You want to get on with what you're doing, with you with what you you love doing. Mm. Um, but then I, I would be concerned about my immediate family. That would be the other issue. I think that's their main concern, really. It's not so much I mean, about themselves. It's about who they might come in contact. If their wives are pregnant or if somebody is an addict or if someone has a heart problem, then that's the real issue, isn't it? I think that's the most obvious one. Any Anybody who's got a member of the family, immediate family, that have an underlying health issue or pregnant, um, that would be a concern. I think then, in that case, then, I think that as tough as it may seem, um, perhaps that player... I possibly would have taken myself to to somewhere else to, to for the remainder of the, the football season, which is probably going to be about five or six weeks. Hmm. So I, I probably would have separated if that had been an issue with my if my wife had been pregnant at the time. Um, I probably would have done that. Um, but I think players are, are sensible enough to to know that's the case. Clubs in in some countries will take them away and isolate the players for the entirety of what's left. Um, the six weeks or so that we need to, to re fulfil the season. Um, that's another good point that, that clubs would, would probably like to do. Um, but I think as young people, healthy, young professional sportsmen, mm. they want to play. You know, it, uh, they prefer it with the 90,000 you get at the camp now or the Bernabeu or the, you know, the supporters that we get in Sevilla. We've got the Sevilla derby to come, which is huh. was the first week, wasn't it, where we the games were suspended. It, everyone was looking forward to the big derby and, and that was suspended. Everybody would prefer to see that. What makes that special is the support, the crowd, the atmosphere. But I think we would all settle for just seeing some action. Um, and the players in general will want to get started again. Do you think there's a risk that the, the quality of the football all across the board, not necessarily in one particular league over another, do you think that there's a risk that it might drop? Because there is such a psychological element of having a, a stadium of 60,000, 70,000 people cheering and, and supporting you and the energy that it, they put into, they inject into the game without them. Is there a risk that it becomes almost like a friendly match? Maybe they don't take it as seriously or because they're not quite used to the the strange surroundings the fact that they are there really is nobody there to, to to watch them and to to cheer them on 
Um, and also added to the fact that maybe they are a bit cautious about coming into contact with another player. I think it depends on where you are in the league. And I think we're going to lose a little bit of quality because the players are not going to have much time to get back up to top sure. speed. Sure. Um, but I think that the motivation will come from your league position. There will be some clubs in the league, some clubs in the Premier League, some clubs in all the countries around Europe, which are mid-table. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in the case of Liverpool, for instance, they need six points. Right. Um, and they need everybody else, to, you know, the other teams, to win every game, which isn't going to happen. So, you know, it, it's... The motivation comes from when you actually start playing again and you are Espanyol, just got the league table, Leganes, Mallorca. Because we have to remind ourselves yeah. where we are. <laughs> because it's been <laughs> such a long time now. And you look and go, yes, there's a race for the top to win the title in La Liga. There's a race for Champions League, a really good race for the Champions yeah. League spots. There's a good relegation encountered tussle going on, which we haven't had in recent seasons. And I, I think we, we need to refresh ourselves that, you know, Alibis are not safe. Levante are not safe. So Even Abar are not really safe, either. Abar are very much in the thick of it. So I think it will take a few minutes, I think. I don't think it will take long. The quality may not be there, but I think we have enough teams motivated to, you know, get into European spots, to win the league, to avoid relegation, for the real stuff to kick in. It's going to seem different to us watching it. We already saw the, was it Abar Real Sociedad game, didn't we? Yeah. And that didn't lack quality. That was still, you know, the, the, exactly as you'd expect. Um, but it may be different. That's Abar's ground, the Perura with a small crowd anyway in a small stadium. It's going to look very different when we see the, the, the big clubs play in their big stadiums with very few supporters. But I think the motivation will be there for enough players in La Liga in particular, because this is what we're talking about with the, the studio that I'm in. Um, then we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we have enough enough issues to make sure that I'm probably looking at Osasuna and Betis. Okay. The Vanti possibly who haven't got lot, you know, are mid table. Okay. Probably not going to get relegated, not going to get into Europe. Um, so it might be more difficult for those players to generate that motivation when they're playing in empty stadiums. And it's interesting also the fact that as the, it's not La Liga, at least four clubs decided to start to, to redevelop and make some work on his stadiums. I yeah. think they're, they're working on Levante yeah. Stadium, Osasuna Stadium, Sevilla and, and Real Madrid. But I think it's at least uh, Levante and Sevilla says that it's something that, that, that doesn't affect the game, so it could be played. But we had to remember that Madrid... Uh, oh, that would be even so asked, interesting to Even asked to end the season playing in his little stadium where normally the second team played because obviously if it's, you don't have people in the stands, it's the same to play in the Santiago Bernabeu or in the Estadio uh, de la Ciudad Deportiva di Stefano, right. the Stefano Stadium, but it's a little stadium. And it's even cheaper for them to open that, that stadium while they're redeveloping the Santiago Bernabeu. So it can be fun to see Madrid playing in the stadium where normally plays the second team, Real Madrid de Castilla. So right. let's see what happened that. And also remember that yesterday, finally, uh, the Spanish Federation, uh, talking with La FIFA, said that all the teams are allowed to make five substitutions in that game. So I was just three. Ask you. So, well, that's another idea. And uh, they said it's a, a way to fight against the, the possibility to, to have the, the players so tired and uh, get injuries. But also because we have to remember that play football in the end of July in Spain or in Italy. Well, to let's talk especially about the weather, the <laughs> especially in the south. Imagine to play the game uh, in Sevilla. Whoa. Well, what are you so going to play at like six in the morning? Because even at 10 o'clock <laughs> at night, it's like 35 degrees. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> it's, that's, it, it is a genuine concern, I have to say. It, it is, it is. It's, 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 that's why the good, a good idea to allow that, five substitutions, but it should be done in three different moments. Not You cannot do five different substitutions. So it right. will be in three different moments, five, substitu five substitutions. No. <laughs> no. Terry no. is not liking this idea whatsoever. But do you think that uh, no, gives an advantage to, to some teams over others? Maybe those who have deeper squads and, and, and more resources than, than others? No, I, I was I, 
don't get me wrong, I was I was going like that because of the 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 efforts of the co-commentator and Tony and I. Was, <laughs> <laughs> it's more names, it's more players to recognize. It's oh my god, he's come on. When did he in, go off? In the yeah. bench, in the bench, you're allowed to have 23 players. Uh, oh, they all have all the rooster like, in the bench. Spaces in between them, right? Like, so that, that is really, really big. So it's a problem, especially for Barca, because we have to remember Barca that they don't have so much players. They had to, to, to bring on Martin Brighton yeah. for that. So they, I think they just have 19 players. We yes. come back a bit to and at the same time, the second team will be playing the promotion to be promoted to the second division. So it will be a moment. Okay, what do we do with the uh, players like Ricky Puch or Ansufati? Play with the second team or with the first team? So it's the modern problems for FC Barcelona. But I think a lot of clubs are going to end up using a lot of their second team players as well. I mean, in, in their academy, especially if if the whole transfer market and they're not allowed to, you know, purchase players or make transfers or whatever, they're going to have to pull from all of their resources. And those resources are definitely going to be coming from from the youth academy. Yeah, but, but also we have to remember that uh, some second teams will be involved in a playoff to be promoted yeah. to second division. That affects, I think, Atletico Madrid, Atletico of Bilbao, uh, FC Barcelona for sure, and I don't think if it's another one. So these teams, it will have this kind of problem. Other teams like Villarreal, like Real Madrid, don't, or Real Sociedad, will not have this, this problem. That, okay. That's unique in Spain as well, because most other countries don't have the second division, the second teams in, in competitive leagues. In England... They pay these players so much money in the Premier League and they have got such big squads. So that, that's not going to be an issue for the... the they'll have to use the players. They will have to. It's it's common sense. Their players are not going to have a long period of pre-season training for this new second part of the season. And they're going to have to rotate the players heavily. I was joking when I said, the worst games as a co-commentator to do, <laughs> I'm sure Tony agrees, are the pre-season friendlies where you get... A different team in the second half, um, <laughs> and you don't know any of those players, and then still more subs come on. And, and after those games finish, you, you have to go and lay down in a dark room and 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 and, and pray that it, it you know this pre season is over with as quickly as possible. <laughs> I hate the thought that we're going to now be in a regular season and writing down <clears throat> how many was it Tony in the squad 23 23 there's 46 yeah. names to, and fig, facts and figures to start with oh, and then boy. during the game we're going to be up to what now five <laughs> subs eight. so that's 22 30 possibly 32 ins and outs uh, 32 players playing and, and part of the game so that was from a selfish point of view it does <laughs> well, that's make... why they pay you the big bucks Terry <laughs> because you can handle it and you can it do makes it sense. Very well. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense that the extra subs are just being, a, from, you know, a little bit selfish thinking, oh, no, 46 names to start with, 32 <laughs> to, to take See, part in Tony, the game. Tony's already starting to Chaos. do his research. We've already lost him. He's starting to do some research on some of those players that can have you going. <laughs> but, 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 I, 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 just, I just have an email. It's from just one minute. I was making jokes about that it's true that Barca don't have a lot of players. They have another problem. Samuel Untiti is injured again. No. So training alone, it's injured no. again. Yeah, on the, on the right foot. <laughs> so maybe he will miss the first game. So what other problem? What is this going is on with this guy? This is breaking news, by the way, everybody. This is breaking news, live. <laughs> <laughs> breaking news, <laughs> yes. Brought to you by Tony Padilla. <laughs> yes. Just two minutes ago, we, I had the, the message from the, the press officer of Barca. So it's one of the problems, obviously. A, a player like Samuel Titi that had been struggling and fighting against physical problems, you had to stay a lot of weeks at home. Okay, yeah. you're doing the job, but it's then you finally you go to the training sporting complex and you start to run. And that, that can happen. That can happen because yeah, it's like a new preseason. He also is coming back from a long-term knee injury and he's been out on the training pitch and kicking the ball about and he looks like he's in great shape. So, I mean... Chimi, yeah. Chimi, el comandante Chimi Avila, I think it's stronger that... Uh, I, 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 yeah. I, I mean, the size uh, of his thighs are about uh, as but, 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 as my but, entire body. But, you know. I, think that, I, think, <laughs> I think that Terry can point on that. It's also the... It's a, a psychological problem. Yeah. If you have been 
suffering a lot of injuries. When you come back to, to run, it's like, oh my God, it can happen again. I think this is the case of, of, of Sam Olomtiti. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. You're obviously worried that something is going to happen again and that you might pick up another injury and then you're going to be sidelined again. And it, it maybe it makes you a bit more fragile. And that's something I think we've also seen with Gareth Bale, you know, a lot too. He comes back from injury and then he seems to pick up another injury or a niggle or whatever it is. But he always seems to be kind of worried as well about his own uh, history of, of, of injury problems. But anyway, I digress. Okay, so before we go on to talk, uh, or to do the quiz, rather, because I'm very, very excited <laughs> to find out who between the two of you knows more about Spanish football. Um, oh, I know. <laughs> I, I think it might be Terry. Might be no. Terry. But, I'm, um, glad, I'm glad I'm going to come second. I'm happy with second. <laughs> no. It's only two of us, but I'm second. <laughs> But I would love to get um, your thoughts about going back to all of those really fun battles that you talked about, Terry, who you think might actually end up winning the league this season, who you think will finish maybe top four, top six, and who might get relegated. Obviously, this is a very difficult hypothetical because we have no idea how these teams and these players are going to be coming back. But if you had to wager a guess, what do you think? Well, I've even started, we have to do a preparation, you know, because I've yeah, completely do. switched off yeah. um, because we knew nothing was going to be happening in the, the, the near future. And now you're suddenly, and I want to sort of get people back in the ball rolling again and, and speak to people and, and get their motivation up for what is an exciting, a really exciting season in, in yeah. the Liga this year. And and it's the two point gap between Barcelona and Real Madrid is just nothing. It can change in a week. You know, if Barcelona lose or draw, or Real Madrid win a game, it changes a game. We saw how quickly it changed. Real Madrid win the Clasico, then drop points. Barcelona and they keep go back to positions as well, don't yeah. they? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't like to. I, I possibly would go with eleven games to go now, um, and I think it's fair to say that both of the teams haven't been at their best this season. It's not the best version, mm. but I think possibly Barcelona with Luis Suarez coming back as well. Who's going to be fit, which no one expected him to take any part. That helps them. That helps, you know, them apart from, I don't know, Martin Braithwaite is thinking now that he came, this happened, and now Suarez is back. Um, yeah. But I, that's a big boost for Barcelona. But that 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 can go either way. I really, if I was going to, I would probably go with Barcelona to put together a really good run now, okay. um, to stretch away at the top um, to maintain their lead. In terms of the, the Champions League spots, I mean, we're looking at Sevilla, Real Sociedad, Hatafe, Atletico, Valencia are still in it. Listen, you I'm know, calling so for Hatafe. I'm not going to lie to you. I would love to see them in the Champions League. It would be a popular choice. They're still involved in the Europa League as well. Yeah. Of course. So that might bring its problems. Did we see? Did I, I write and seeing that the president this week yeah. gave free season tickets next season? To... For those who had the season tickets for this season, he said it's going to be free for the remainder of the 11 games, but it will also roll over to the next season as well. So they'll have That's... free season tickets for, for yeah. Until it's thir- the 13 and a half thousand. Amazing. Well, you, you think back, you know, the last time Hetafe were in the La Liga, um, when they got relegated, uh, I wouldn't go as far to say I wasn't sorry to see the back of them, but it was a, <laughs> it, 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 there was no atmosphere in the, in the yeah. stadium. But you know, so much has changed with her. Incre- her so, so much has changed. For them to have 13,500 season ticket holders and now what the president has done, that, that's mm-hmm. great news. So, no, I think you know, we've got, you know, as I say, Sevilla, Ralph Sossi, that have been brilliant to watch this season. You know, one of the favourite teams of most neutrals to watch, Ralph Sossi, that play their games. Atletico have got the bit between the teeth. They would have, good, they would have had good momentum after beating Liverpool in the Champions League. Yeah. And, you know, that was their last game. So that would have dissipated by the time they come back. But so they'll have to rebuild momentum, motivation, confidence. But they're, they're, they were the ones to complain that if the season ends now, we are only a point off of the top four. Yeah. So they've got to do their talking on the pitch. Um, it's And then you look at the relegation. I would probably go, you asked me, and I waffled on and not given you an, a, a, a choice. I would probably go with... Sevilla. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and Atletico. Okay, so we've got Barcelona, Madrid, Atletico and Sevilla as the top four. Yes. Okay, and then Europa League, five and six. Uh, Real Sociedad. 
and Valencia. And Valencia. Ooh. Okay, so no room for Hetafe. And what about bottom three? I'm going Espanol. It's hard to make a case for them now, isn't it? They're, they're, they're six points adrift of safety. Um, so that's going to take three or four games to close that gap up. Time's running out for them now. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm actually going to go with Celta. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's and I've, I've even got to the stage where I'm looking at the, the remaining fixtures. And they've got oh, yeah, some. They've got, we're at that stage now where it becomes important, and and I, I just feel they've been there for too long. And I like what I see from Mallorca. Mallorca just about win every every two, three, four games. They pick up a win. Um, their away form has you know needs to, to improve, but they've started getting one or two points away from home. I like the spirit of of Mallorca. I saw you know a really good program on La Liga TV, and I must. And not just because I, I've worked with you guys, but the, the content on that channel during this break, the people behind the scenes that put together stuff, occasionally you, you, you're often flicking through the channels and you come up and you see Vicente Moreno zooming in on his team and doing the training sessions on and how the Mallorca are working. And they've got a great spirit. You've seen players doing their running in their gardens and stuff. Some of the programmes have been fantastic, you know, to yeah. watch. And, and that was it. And that reminded me of the spirit they knew from day one that they were going to be in a relegation battle. It's taken Celta by surprise. Um, so Mallorca in there with their sleeves rolled up. They've got their fists clenched. And they're, they, they're going to fight to the very end. So I'm going to go for Leganes to go down Espanyol and Celta. All right. And I'm going to go for Mallorca to, to survive. All right. Tony, you're up. Uh, I, 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 I also see Espanyol and, and Leganes. It's, it's, it's a difficult battle for them. So everything can happen, but if I have to choose three because it's just a game, I will say that Leganes and, and Espanol. And I'm afraid of Eibar. Yeah. It's something I, I definitely don't want because I, I love the team, I love the place, I love the people. But uh, also they seem like, um, well, it, the, it's, I'm not worried about, about what can happen with, with Eibar, so maybe to, it can be one of the surprises to see Eibar going down. But it's difficult to choice because... I love the most part of the teams that they are involved in that yeah. fight, so I don't want them to go down. I don't want Felt, I don't want Mallorca to go down. So I will say Eibar, Leganes, and Espanol. Okay. I, I agree with Terry. I see Barca winning the league with, with, with Luis Suarez scoring, scoring goals. Madrid, then I expect maybe uh, a good reaction of Atletico Madrid. Okay. So even they can make it to end third. And Real Sociedad to go forward because now they don't have to think anymore about the Spanish Cup final because the Federation agreed to play the, 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 right. the Spanish Cup final next season in order to try to find a way to do it with supporters because we have to remember it's the Basque Derby. It's Athletic Club against Real Sociedad, so Which everyone wants to be in the, the stadium. Right it was the right so ball let's see if uh, they can end the season maybe next year. So just focusing in, in that, Real Sociedad with a lot of young players flying, I think that maybe they can end four. And then it will be, in that case, Sevilla and Getafe to go to Europa League. Okay. Maybe. Sevilla I don't know. But well, so yeah. you, <laughs> we don't know. Don't Valencia take it personally. Valencia is left out for you and Getafe is left out for Terry. If you're okay. a fan of that so team, don't, of don't season... take it personally. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. So by the end of the season, we'll see, yeah, we'll see who, who's right, who gets the most <laughs> number of uh, guesses right of, of these teams and so on. So speaking of which... Quiz time. Oh, my God. By the way, guys, for those of you watching too, you can also let us know what you think about what's going to happen in each one of those individual battles as well because we would love to know what you think, if you think it's going to be Barcelona champion or somebody else, and who's going to finish in the European competition as well as relegation. And when it comes to this quiz as well, feel free to also chime in and uh, <laughs> let us know what you think the right answer is. So here are the rules of the game. It's going to be 10 questions. All of them are multiple choice to make it easy for you guys. Okay. So write down whatever <laughs> answer you think is correct. When you both are ready, you'll both show me. And we'll keep track of who knows. Okay. So we have to write more it. answers. So we can write, is it A, B, C, or one, two, three? It's A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, D. Four options. Four options. But feel free, you can do either letters or you can do actually don't do letters. Write out write out the actual word because it'll be okay. easier. Otherwise, we're oh. gonna get confused. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have to ready? press a buzzer? <laughs> <laughs> can we 
we need something to I ring a bell. I thought about that, but I wasn't Terry sure Gibson. you guys had buzzers. Me. So for next time, for next time, you guys buy buzzers in the meantime, and then we'll come back, we'll do this again. The and then it'll be whoever ends who gets their quickest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? Ready. Ready. Yes. Number one. Speaking of Copa del Rey, which team has won the most Copa del Rey trophies? Real Madrid, Barcelona, Athletic Club, or Sevilla? Do we put it out? Not yet. Wait till you're both ready. You're both ready. <laughs> Terry, what did you put? Barcelona. Barca. Well done, both of you. Barcelona. That is correct. <laughs> correct, correct. All right. Number two. Which club has the most points in the all-time La Liga table? Real Madrid, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, or Athletic Club? Oh. This happened recently. <laughs> this, 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 I saw this in the news recently, and I can't remember which one went ahead. I'm gonna go, yeah. Ooh, you both look stumped on this one. I'm gonna go Barcelona. Barcelona. Oh, Terry's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it's, it's both my back. Bar Barcelona, right? Yeah. yeah my, okay. My, Incorrect. My... It's Real Madrid. Ah. Well done, oh. Pablo. He knows the answer. He said Real Madrid. So both of you are level on one one. Okay. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Which player has the most hat-tricks in the history of La Liga? Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Alfredo Di Stefano, or Telmo Zara? Bonus points if you know how many. No. It's my, my, my green... What do they call it? The green screen. The green screen. <laughs> it's playing havoc with my answers, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, so I might have to... Uh, I'm going to go with Messi. Well Messi done. Too. Messi, Messi. 36 how many? tricks. Well done. Do all you know right. how many? 36. 30. Oh, is that all? I thought it was more than that. <laughs> oh, no. Career hat tricks, I think it's more than 50, but in La, Les, in, in La Liga, it's uh, 36. Okay. Who is the Spanish national team's all time top scorer? Raul, David Villa, Fernando Torres, or Hierro? Uh, Come on, Tony, if you don't know this one. <laughs> I'm really bad in that one. It disappeared. Oh, you disappeared. I have to say, man. David Villa. Yes. Well Big done. Well. Bravo. Bravo. Okay. 3-3. <laughs> three, three. So we're still tied. <laughs> Next. Sweating. Which nation, apart from Spain, has provided the most La Liga players over the history of the competition? Brazil? Argentina? France or Portugal? Uh. <laughs> oh my God. Well, why do you look so stressed, Tony? Yeah, no, should I go first? Because mine is. Uh, go I'm going to go Argentina. Argentina, too. Yes, well done. See, you guys, you know the answers to this. Question. <laughs> it's too easy. Next time I have to make it harder. Even though I have to say I can't take credit for these questions, I did take them from a quiz that was already made up by Marca. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'll come up with my own questions. Okay, which of these Spanish autonomous communities has had the most La Liga titles? The Basque Country, Valencia, Madrid, or Catalonia? I'm going to do this slowly and see if it gets there. It goes for a brief moment and then it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go Madrid. Madrid as well. Well done. Madrid. Although, I'm not quite sure. I think it might be the Basque Country. So that one, I'll have to double check. No, anyway, no. It should, it should be it should Madrid. Be Madrid. Because, it should be because Madrid. Madrid. Madrid is the team with, the team with more titles is Madrid. Well, there you go. Madrid. Real Sofia, Real Sofia just had two. So... It should uh, between Madrid and Atletico Madrid. It's more than Athletic Club and Real Sociedad together for okay. sure. Madrid, done, correct. <laughs> Next one. 
Which team did Samuel Eto not play for? Leganés, Barcelona, Mallorca or Zaragoza? Ooh. I'm going to try and find a way that this works on my green screen. No, it doesn't. I'm going to go with Zaragoza. Zaragoza. Well done. Zaragoza, correct. Man, one of you needs to get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How many teams have ever won the Copa del Rey? 10, 12, 14, or 16? Oh, I have a feeling oh. that this is going to be the dividing question. Mm. How many times I have to? Do? <laughs> How many teams? How many different teams have ever won the Copa del Rey? And the options were? 10, 12, 14, or 16? <laughs> I have no idea and I've guessed and I love the way that Tony actually is working it through I know he's, he's really trying it. To he's, you can see him <laughs> counting he knows every team that's won it but there might be one missing Tony <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to go yeah 16. I've got with 14 14 is the correct answer Terry takes the lead <laughs> no idea <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about. I wonder that. Uh, <laughs> he was trying to, he was trying to count. It's possible that that, that 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 doesn't include the teams that doesn't ex exist anymore, but they won it in the past. Uh, see, see, now he's trying to find a loophole. Tony's <laughs> <laughs> like one of those Premier League teams that's worried about getting relegated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Against which team did Real Madrid win their first European Cup? Rim, Rim, I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry, the French team, Rim. Yeah. Benfica, AC Milan, or Eintracht Frankfurt? Frankfurt! Frankfurt. I'm gonna go with the, yeah. Oh God, I've gone with Reims. Well the done, Reims. bravo. Bravo. Correct answer. This is the last one. So, Tony, this is your chance to, to level it up, to end, you know, tied <laughs> for, for glory in this wonderful <laughs> Time Talks <laughs> pub quiz in our living room. <laughs> it's an extra time, you friend. <laughs> yeah, I should have thought of a bonus question. Okay, who was the last Pichichi other than Leo Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? Diego Forlan, Karim Benzema, Luis Suarez, or Dani Guiza? Dani Guiza, do you remember him? He was great, wasn't he? Yeah. For a little, for a short Ages while. Ago, right? Yeah, when he scored those goals, he went to the Euros, didn't he? Yeah, he scored. Oh, yeah. He, he yeah. scored. He scored in the semi-final against Russia. Yeah. Wow. So you can remember that, Tony, but you can't remember how many gloves are. Oh my god. And maybe I can't remember that as well. <laughs> oh, I'm only joking. Okay. Okay. I'm so let's go. With go. Luis Suarez. Forlan. Luis Suarez, bravo. I'm not going to lie, when I did the test too, I thought it was Forlan, so I was also wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Luis Suarez in 2016. So well done, Terry. You are the... You're the champion! You are the champion! <laughs> what, what surprise! Yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised. Uh, a coffee the next time I see you. <laughs> <laughs> then it's not so hard to end second. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't really think about fun. the prize bit. I probably should have done that. If you have any recommendations, I'm open to hearing them. <laughs> it's got us back into the, our mood now. We can start building up the pre preparation for the comeback. Definitely, definitely. I think we're all very much looking forward to it. So that will be nice. So anyway, guys, I guess we'll leave it here. It's been lovely to chat with you. Tony, have we lost you? <laughs> This man is addicted to his phone. 
<laughs> no, no, I'm still looking about the Copal. Check the answer. Because ah, he's checking because <laughs> he doesn't believe it's the right answer. I still okay. have my doubts about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can prepare a rematch if you want for another time, Tony. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was my my, my mistake. It, yeah, I did. I had to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gracefully think... accepting defeat. It's been great catching up with you guys. I've missed my little visits out to to Barcelona, and hopefully, I'm going to be able to get out there at some stage this season. And yeah. it's been great to catch up with with both of you again. We miss you here too. We miss you too, Tony or Tony Terry, both of you. TNT. We miss, <laughs> we miss, we miss both everyone. of you. <laughs> I like that song. I love that song. Great song, isn't it? <laughs> That should yep. be our that should be our theme song whenever the yeah. two of you are together on the, yeah. <laughs> in the studio with me. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll take care of yourselves. It's been so much fun, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll all get to see each other sometime soon in person. Yeah, obviously, especially in person. Yeah, yeah. Especially cool. in person. So in the meantime, <laughs> take care of yourselves. <laughs> Wait for you to join hey, me hey. in the studio. Oh, of course, join you in the studio. That's the way it's going to be done. You're already, you're already there waiting for us. And Vicente Ibora. <laughs> At least we're in good company, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll take, take care, summer. you guys. And you, Tony. Bye bye. See you guys sometime soon. And thanks to everybody else for being with us. We hope that you enjoyed the chat and we hope you enjoyed the quiz as well. And uh, take care. Have a great week. And see you uh, next week for some more chats on Tea Time Talks. Adios.